mission. Should you choose to accept it. It's a quest! It's a quest for fun! Well, The Rock says, why don't we just cut right to the chase? Okay, now he, uh, you know, he wants to get together. Well, you know, he wants to talk. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. It's showtime, folks! What are you? I'm... Greetings and salutations. Welcome to And I Quote, the weekly show where we introduce you to content creators of all shapes and sizes. Join us from any and all corners of the nerd universe to find out more about them and what plans they have for the future. I am your host, Ryan of Nerd Culture, and our guest this week is a legendary writer and poet. Please welcome Molly Daniels. Molly, welcome to the program. How are you? Hi. I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. And if you have any questions for Molly during any portion of this show, leave us a comment. Let us know in the live chat. We will be monitoring those as we go throughout the course of the show. So in the meantime, Molly, what were some of your favorite books or writers growing up? Oh, gosh. Um, we've got to go way back. Um, I started reading my mother's biographies in the second grade. Um, she had Harry Beecher Stowe, Mary Mapes Dodge, uh, Sacagawea, and uh, Julia Ward Howe, and just read those over and over again. And then she introduced me to Little Women by Louisa Mal May Alcott, and I was hooked. Um, and then... Um, Beverly Cleary with the Ramona and the Beezus and Ramona and Henry in the clubhouse, that whole series hooked me. And, um, and then later on, I moved on to Nancy Drew Mysteries and Judy Bloom. I think Judy Bloom, I got introduced in about the sixth grade and just had to read, read everything of hers. So I was, and then there, of course, there's a lot of, books in my junior high library that only had my name on it when we had the card and my name filled both sides I, I checked them out so much so all my life been a prolific reader oh there you go good title some classics right there no worries yeah. about that now when did you specifically decide to become a writer um in the fifth grade it was really weird i mean my friends and i would always act out stories and they hated playing barbies with me because i was the one that um would you know set up the dialogue and then they wouldn't follow it and I'd get mad and then I don't want to play with you anymore so I had all these stories in my head but never really knew how to get them out and for a long time I thought okay I'll just be an actress or something well then in the fifth grade a student teacher walked in one day with a long with an LP and said we're gonna do something different we're going to, I'm going to put this record on and you're going to pull out a sheet of paper and just write whatever comes to mind. Hmm. And I thought, okay, I got excited. I'm like, okay. So he puts on this weird classical, it sounded sci-fi thing to me. Mm -hmm. And I had just seen the movie Logan's Run with my dad. And that's the first thing that popped into my mind. I thought, okay, I'll write my version of Logan's Run. And from that I don't even remember how long we did this because I mean, my story filled about a page and a half. So I'm guessing it was maybe a half hour or whatever, just however long I wrote it. But from then on, I was hooked. It's like, Hey, I can get the, and this is how I get these stories out of my head. I can just write them down. And then we started writing, you know, we would get writing assignments and I was excited because I could, do this. I didn't like being told what to write, but when we could just, you know, write our own thing, I loved it. And so that's really what kind of kickstarted it. And I actually, you know, I had these stories that had the, by the end of the fifth grade, fifth, by the end of the fifth and sixth grade, I had these collection of fairy tales and I thought, okay, instead of, you've heard of Grimm's fairy tales, we'll have, mm -hmm. you know, we'll have Molly's fairy tales. And that's how it kind of all started. And then in the junior high, we were taught the concept of journaling. And I had I had acquired my first diary at the end of the fifth grade, but it really wasn't consistent with it. But the idea of taking this little bitty small spiral notebook, you know, um, journal sized, it wasn't even, it wasn't the big one, there were the smaller ones. And writing every day was wonderful. Because by then, I had kind of fallen to the bottom of the social pecking order. And it was a way to get out all of my inner conflict and my anger at my classmates. 
So it was, it was very cathartic and just a way to open up the imagination. And then every once in a while, you know, I'd get an idea and I'd just go to my room and write it down and come out, hey, mom, listen to this. And everybody liked them. So it, it just opened up a whole world to me. Mm, my that goodness gracious. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, thank you for sharing that with us. I do appreciate it. What would you say are some of the biggest rewards of being a writer? The biggest reward? Well, before it was published, it was just the satisfaction of seeing this pile of paper that I had written and, you know, the fact that my, my uh, parents enjoyed them. And uh, when I was a senior in high school, we had to do our own children's book. And I was a student teacher at an elementary school across the street. And so I took it over and read it to my first graders and they loved it. I mean, they wanted to read it over and over again. So I actually cut it up into separate things and had made little um, crude little drawings. And so then I called them up and gave them each a piece of the story and then they all read it. And so that was just fun. Just seeing the joy on their faces is like, wow, you wrote this. And then after I was published, the biggest thrill was having people tell me how much they enjoyed it. And now, of course, I'm 31 books in and still I love talking to I love talking to new readers. I love talking to new authors and pulling them along. Hey, if I can do it, you can, too, because look, when I started out, I had I had a book called How to Get Published and it got me nowhere. Oh. Um, I was sending query letters and mm -hmm. absorbing everything I could on my own until I think I saw an ad on television or something for a writer's workshop in Indianapolis. And at that point, I'm like, can I do, can I go this? This is what I really want to do. And my husband fortunately said, Oh yeah, sure. You can do that. So off I went and just absorbed so much. I'm like, where were these people 10 years ago? <laughs> so that was, and then I found out if I'd paid attention in college, there was a writer's workshop at Ball State at the time. And it admittedly, I don't know when it got founded. So I may not have actually been there when I was there. Right. But that's something I would have loved to have done and probably would have gotten started a lot sooner. But, you know, mm. things happen for a reason. So, mm -hmm. no, yes, they certainly do. Once again, we're talking with writer and poet Molly Daniels here. If you have any questions for her, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the live chat. Be more than happy to take those questions as they come up. Also, make sure you're sharing this video. With all 500 of your closest friends, they're going to like the way they look after watching this video. I guarantee it. So on the flip side of that, Molly, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges of being a writer? The big, biggest challenges um, right now is actually doing the writing um, and just taking the time to do it because um, life kind of imploded on us about 10 years, yeah, 10 years ago. And before that, I mean, I was dedicated i um i would i love i would love to go back to days where i would send my children off to school at eight o'clock and then come home fix myself a cup of coffee watch the rest of the news and then shut everything off turn the radio on and then just write from nine till noon wow. take a break for lunch and then if i had any errands i'd do them then or i would just get back and the kids knew that if mom wasn't at school when they got out of school, she was in the zone and it wasn't paying any attention to the time and to get on the bus. <laughs> so they would come home and mom, I'm home. Oh, I'm sorry. I lost track of time. Yeah, that's what we figured. Okay. And then, um, but unfortunately my husband retired. So now I'm stuck home with, with, um, I'm not saying, I'm not saying stuck home, but, uh, um, I, my favorite hour of the day is when he leaves to go pick up the granddaughter at work. And then I have the house to myself and it's quiet, <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, life has definitely changed in the last 10 years. And I, I don't spend, I can't spend, you know, six to eight hours in my, at my desk chair working anymore. I have to find it where I can, so, wow. and, which is usually, I, <laughs> which is usually right now, sometimes I'll just get started and I'm like, Hey, let's go to the store. Oh, you want me to leave? Okay. So sometimes I can get in a couple of good hours in the afternoon. Sometimes I can grab it in the morning. It just depends on 
what his plan for the day is. <laughs> <laughs> so is it fair to say within your writing process, you prefer to be nice, full, or nice, peace, quiet, no noise, no distractions, no technology around? Do you prefer pure quietness or do you have anything playing in the background? Do you oh, have no, a I, I, have, I, I have written with Bon Jovi in the background, Prince in the background. Uh, with my, um, when my youngest was, was growing up, I learned to play with Dora Explorer and SpongeBob SquarePants and uh, Bob the Builder in the background. Um, so I, I prefer the, no I can just, it, it helps me get started, but then I tune it out because one day I realized I forgot to hit the um, repeat play on my CD player. Oh yeah, I remember those I had, things. I had popped in um, Bon Jovi's Lost Highway CD and all of a sudden realized I, I kind of came to and, oh, CD stopped playing. When did that happen? Oh, well, it's been two hours. Apparently it quit about 50 minutes ago. So, <laughs> Whoa, and God. one day I plotted out an entire storyline um, in the bar. I was waiting for a job interview and there was loud music playing and I'm just plotting. I'm just not paying attention to the noise. I'm just plotting with the next. I'm plotting out the, out, the uh, general right. outline of the book, right. the book. And then, of course, I go, I do sing karaoke once a week. And if I'm in the zone, like right now for um, Nano, I'll take my notebook to karaoke. And um, last year, I interviewed a bridge, and people were like, Well, how did you come up with that? I'm like, Well, I think there was a rum and coke involved. <laughs> well, and some yeah. bad singing in the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to say whatever makes it whatever helps you make it through the process or whatever helps make make you through help you get through the night is what I'm trying to say. I'm exactly. sorry, I maybe stumbled over my words there. My bad, but <laughs> boy, that's a very unique writing process. But I'm just curious. A quick sidebar here: favorite Bon Jovi song? Favorite Bon Jovi song? Favorite one? Oh, um, got? it's one that doesn't get played a lot. It's called Silent Night. It's off of their first album with Run with um, uh, Runaways on that album. Really. Uh, it's wow. called Silent Night, and I love that song. I wish they would. I wish they would sing it more. Um, mm -hmm. My favorite, my favorite uh, popular song is probably still Runaway. It's a toss up between Runaway and um, oh, um, either I'll Be There for You mm -hmm. or um, uh, Living in Sin. Oh, love okay. Living in Sin. Okay, you know, quick side story. When I'm at karaoke before the world kind of <clears throat> ended. Mm -hmm. When I went to karaoke, one of my first songs was a Bon Jovi tune, and I believe it was, is it, it well, actually, no, there's a, few, there's a few. You Give Love a Bad Name yeah, and mm -hmm. Wanted Dead or Alive. Oh, I do a, I do a really good Wanted Dead or Alive. Do you? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. When Rockstar came out, yes. I think it was Rockstar. Yeah. What, was that the one um, with, uh, what? Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise played the aging Rockstar. Oh, you mean, he, you mean uh, Rock of Ages? Rock of Ages, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, Rock he played Ages. Stacey Jacks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I think I sing "Wanted Dead or Alive" much better than Tom Cruise. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. He should just be <laughs> a spy known as Ethan Hunt within the Mission Impossible franchise. My goodness gracious! Well, but before I get to my next question, a number of people want to jump in and hear. Willow Skyler says, "Good afternoon, everyone." Willow, how are you? She Hi, is the Willow. host of Willow's Pillow Talk, which you can find on HWS Web TV. Hashtag always support your friends. Hey, Carl, good to see you. Carl, Hi, says, Carl. Like, he says, I can't say I have a needy wife and too many house guests, but I wanted to come in and just say and wave <laughs> hi to everybody. Thanks, Carl. Appreciate it. Enjoy your house guests. Sorry, did that come out wrong? Sorry, Carl. Brian Looking Wenzel forward to see you again. <laughs> exactly. Brian Wenzel says, hello, everyone. What's up, Brian? Host, uh, one of the co-hosts of Reels and Heels. Once again, you can find that on HWS Web TV. By the way, there she is, Molly. We spoke about you earlier, Keisha. We figured you'd jump in here. There she is. Hello, beautiful people. Hello, Keisha. Hi, Keisha. How are you, Keisha? Let us know. We'd love to hear. We would love to hear about it. Such good stuff. This is it, it. It's so good to have all these wonderful people known as friends. It's great, isn't it? Yes, it is. Oh, friends. Now, you've heard this posted, or you've heard this being said in a movie trailer that you may have watched a few times, either either growing up or maybe you've heard it more mm -hmm. recently. I'm not sure. Every journey has a first step. Every saga has a beginning, but mm -hmm. every generation has a legend. Now you took part in something known as creative generations. Tell us about it. Well, creative generations came about because I had heard that my dad had, had written stories all my life, but mom had never 
Mom never knew where they were. Dad would never let us read them. Well, when he passed in November of 2019, we were cleaning up the, we were cleaning out his um, office area, and I found his binder full of these handwritten stories, and started reading them, and they were fantastic. And so I was wondering what to, you know, what do we need to do with this? And so I thought, well. You know, I, I, I went home and I typed him up. Well, then when we moved my mother into assisted living right after dad passed, mm -hmm. we found my grandmother's poetry, some of it. I have some more hidden somewhere in this house. I don't know where it's at, but I will find it. That's the beauty of being self-published. I can go back in and add them in. <laughs> um, true. But then to make, I was trying to get to 100 pages. So I thought, well, I'll just throw in the stuff that I wrote, you know, the stuff that I wrote as a kid. Because I had some really kind of, you know, cutesy stories. So I, I dug through my files and found them and put them all in and organized it. And like I said, I was just trying to get a small little book. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of funny because like the first, I don't know if you can see this, the first part is my dad. And then we have a little tinier section that's my grandmother. And then the rest of the book is all me. <laughs> I had more stuff in there than I thought. So then we were kicking around the idea of what to call it. And, um, you know, I didn't know if I would wanted to call it like a, a tr you know, a, um, a tribute to, you know, like Mike and Molly or something like that. Mm -hmm. Cause my dad's name is Michael. Oh. And, and, uh, and then all of a sudden somebody said, you need to put something creative in there. And I thought, Oh, well, we've got the generations. Why don't we just call it, creative generations, generations of creativity. And she's like, I like creative generations. And so we went with that. And then the um, wonderful, I, I, I didn't know who, to, who would be best to design the cover because my cover artist mainly does, she doesn't really do general fiction. She does. Um, and Donna Dominique does wonderful work. Um, I highly recommend she's got her, she's got some beautiful pre-mades, but I would look through all her pre-mades and wasn't coming up with anything that looked good mm -hmm. for this particular thing. And Donna gets sidebar. Donna gets me. I can send her a blurb and she will send me the most beautiful cover. I think I've only had to request two minor changes. Sure. Yeah, not quite it. She's wonderful. But I had seen some of Kathy Jackson's covers that are really beautiful. And I knew her husband, Matt did it. So I thought, Oh, send this to Matt and see what he can do with it. Well, he sent me a link to his, the sites that he uses. And so while clicking through various things, you know, putting in di different mm -hmm. things, I came across this picture of an old typewriter and I thought that would be perfect because it had a picture, it had a paper rolled up and I thought, how awesome is that? We could, we could put the title in the paper. Mm -hmm. And so I sent it, I contacted Matt, and Mad Kelt Designs, and he sent me that beautiful photo, and he said, oh, what do you think of this? I'm like, that's perfect. Let's do it. So, and then he created the whole cover wrap, and we had some interesting challenges because um, I think my father did not want this project to be done because my computer ate the manuscript four times before I had it saved. Ooh. And which was frustrating. I had it saved in um, Scrivener. Mm -hmm. So every time I compiled it, formatted it, beautiful, hit save, exit, you know, close the computer. Next day, <laughs> where did you go? I can't find you. <laughs> so I had to do it all. I, I had to do this like four times. And then finally, the fifth time, I saved it. Mm hmm. And then went back and checked, and like, there it is. Okay, we know where it is. <laughs> so we finally got that all put together, and I wanted the book to come out on June 28th, which was my dad's birthday. And so it came out on his 79th birthday, what would have been his 79th birthday. Oh. And um, so far it's been well-received. We opened it up to mainly just family and friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And um, people uh, people are like, oh, I had no idea your dad had so much creativity. Oh, this is, must be where you get it. I'm like, well, yeah, but it's my, my mother's grandmother and mm -hmm. my dad. So maybe it's on all sides. Who knows? <laughs> but because um, I'd have no idea if my 
my maternal grandmother was a gifted pianist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and my paternal grandmother um she always wanted to play the organ and she she managed it a little bit so i've kind of got a little bit of everything in my background <laughs> i've got the uh I've, my my maternal great-grandmother right. was a concert pianist oh wow a girl well not maybe a concert pianist, but a very gifted pianist right. and um so that's i guess that's where i get the music from and mm -hmm. then apparently on my dad's side is where I get the, the, the written creativity. Now my mom, I mean, she was one of those who could knock out a term paper like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she was like me, she can't outline. I'll make an, I would, in um, English class, I would make the outline, but my, my papers never followed it. I always had to go back and redo the outline because that's why I learned I just I just can't do that because my brain will go off on several tangents and I just can't follow this thing. Now I can reel it back in and go, okay, you have to. You know, here's the ending I want. Quit trying to do this. You're gonna you know I can reel them back in and do this, but sometimes it doesn't and it takes off. It just goes off in a whole new tangent and who knows where where the ending will end up. But oh, when you read the paper, you have to have that conclusion and I had to reel it in so. So yeah, it was interesting, and then, um, mm -hmm. but like I said, the uh, um, the book has so far been well received with family and friends, and eventually, when we get done remembering everybody we want to send this to, mm -hmm. I'm going to pull it down and throw in some. I found some raunchy poetry that I wrote in college huh. that my mother really doesn't need to see. So I'm going oh to put my. it in there. I'm going to put it in there, and and then open it up wide, because right now it's only available in the U.S. and Canada. Because my sister lives in Canada. Right. So, right. Yeah. Oh, well, that's man. My goodness gracious, that is truly amazing. Because I because I know we were all we're always taught to never judge a book by its cover. But mm -hmm. I must say, this cover is very striking. Yeah, it's definitely very, it grabs it grabs my attention, certainly, because you see the typewriter, you see where it says the title and all that information is there for you. I'm thinking, oh, is this a part? This this is a part of history. This sounds interesting to me. I may want to pick this up and read it. So whenever it's available to the public, <laughs> definitely let us know. We'll put we'll we'll promote it on our social media channels because this yeah. looks, definitely looks like something I would want to dive into. And maybe you who are watching this would want to dive into. And I have to I do have to warn you, there's some. Apparently, I didn't have much of a filter in junior high and high school. So some of the essays that I wrote were very just off the cuff. And I'm not someone who likes to go back and edit my work. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy with, I can write a good B paper. Had no interest in cleaning it up for an A. So whenever I would turn something in, I just, re I did what fell out on the page, I turned in. And some of the stuff I was reading, I'm like, good Lord. So some of it is not in there, mm -hmm. but the ones and a couple of them slipped in. I, when I was um, going back and making my notes at the end, I'm like, oh, geez, teenage drama. Okay. <laughs> but that shows it's, it's a very good example of what you can, uh, what was going on in my 14 year old mind at the time. <laughs> 14 years old, man, I was 14 years old once, granted, it was a long time ago, but I digress. No, listen, creativity knows no bounds. Let's just keep, let's just leave it at that. And by the way, Keisha chimes in here. She says, hey, I'm good. I'm just getting ready for my own daughter's birthday party. So good on you, Keisha. Hope your daughter has a wonderful. Happy birthday, Keisha's daughter. Uh, her, her daughter's name is Dolores. So there, Happy there birthday, Dolores. There you go. And Brian chimes, he, Brian wants to chime in with a little bit of a comment on your favorite piece of music. He says, the streets have no name by you to you yes. too is probably the best song ever written according to Brian Wenzel. So watch yourself. Agree. I love that intro, and that is my favorite. That and Pride are my two favorite YouTube songs to sing at karaoke. Well, that is that is fair. And by the way, Brian makes a comment about your uh, your book, Creative Generations. You had me at raunchy. <laughs> well, there, there you. There you go. Stay tuned for more details on it, Brian. We'll let it, we'll let you know once we have more details. And he also chimes in by saying, "Ryan, weren't you 14 years old last week?" 
<laughs> maybe Brian, maybe I was, yeah. maybe I was, I'm, I'm not sure. I'll have to get back to you on that one, Brian, get, cut me some slack, Jack. Yeah. Once again, we're talking with uh, writer and poet Molly Daniels. If you have any questions for her, let us know in the live chat. Let us know in the comments. We'd be more than happy to take them as we go throughout the course of the program. So we talked about creative generations. Now, this is something that's a little bit, that's a little bit more uh, current. Now, I've played in the fan leagues of movie trivia, and one of the categories we have in the fan leagues of movie trivia is called mixed bag. But this mm -hmm. doesn't have to do with a mixed bag of movie trivia. Specifically, this is called... No. Mixed bag from First City Books. Tell us about yeah. it. Yeah, mixed bag um, came across because we've published. This is our fifth one. Yeah, this is our fifth one. The first one we had a hotel theme in hotel stories. Oh. Uh, the second one we had a whisper theme in whispers, in which I have my first ghost and fairy stories. I'm in a writers group with mainly fantasy and sci-fi authors, mm -hmm. and I'm the only romance one. Well, right now I'm only the only romance author in there. Or I was. Um, and we've had come people drift in and out. Um, number three was uh, Bad Decisions, which mm -hmm. is not for the faint of heart. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a story in there that Stephen King would be proud of. Not oh, mine. Boy. It was another one of our other authors. Mm -hmm. And then um, we, we then we did Bridges last year, and then we weren't sure what to come up with the title for this one. And so we thought, well, let's just do a mixed bag. Let's not do any specific theme, just whatever people want to, you know, because people sometimes have trouble adhering to a theme. Mm -hmm. So we just called it mixed bag and opened it up to whatever we wanted to write. And we ended up with one sweet romance, my murder mystery, um, another one that's got an interesting take on the uh, uh, Native, Native American um, uh, dream catcher idea. It's, it's really cool. And then there's two others that I really don't know how to describe. Um, one's kind of a out there sci-fi thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I'm sorry, Travis, I really don't know how to describe your story. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it just came out last month. And so far it's outselling hotel. Normally hotel stories is my, is my um, hot seller this time of year because of all the ghost stories in it. Mm -hmm. And sidebar again, I tell people I'm the lone sweet romance author in a book of paranormal fiction because I didn't get the memo that we were supposed to do haunted hotel ghost stories. Oh, my ho my uh, hotel story is assistant manager meets rock star. Mm -hmm. Everyone else talks about the ghosts in the, <laughs> in the, in the haunted hotels. <laughs> so that's why I hopped on board and wrote my first fairy ghost stories and whispers. And then it just kind of went from there, but it's, it's it kind of cute. We can, it's, it gives me a break from writing the full length novels and I can just knock out these short stories that are in my head or whatever happens to come in. And the uh, interviewing the bridge last year came on about, cause we were brainstorming about ideas of what to, you know, how to, you know, do we want real bridges? Do we want his metaphorical bridges? We want sci-fi bridges. And Travis Grendon popped up, says, I just want someone to interview the bridge. And the light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, okay, I can do this. So when I pitched that book, I joke that now we know what the pandemic did to my brain because now I talk to inanimate objects. Because my mm -hmm. other story in there is about a little girl who wants to save her county bridge. And I realized... 95% of it is from the bridge's point of view. So, yeah, the pandemic did a really weird thing to my brain. <laughs> it gave a voice to these inan inanimate objects. D exactly. It gave a voice to a bridge. Hey, if Supernatural can have an episode that focuses entirely on the car known as Baby, I guess, you know, Molly exactly. and your team, you can write stories that are told from the viewpoint of a bridge rather than a yeah, car. That's definitely. I mean, G. Willikers, what do I know? Brian <laughs> Wensloff chimes in in regards to things you can do for inspiration. Brian says, Molly, if you're looking for some music to get inspiration from, listen to Westlife from Ireland as they have a very powerful lyrics as well as great vocals. Okay. I used to write to uh, Hooked on Classics. Hmm. My husband had an eight-track tape of Hooked on Classics, and I'd, I'd put the kids down for a nap and pop that thing in. That was my favorite two hours of the day. I could just sit at the coffee table and write in the with the music of Tchaikovsky and Mozart in the background. Ooh, Mozart. Yeah. 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 Mozart's good stuff. Beethoven's good stuff. Sibelius, Bach, all those, yeah. all, all those composers of, of yesteryear, you know, the classics, yeah. if you will, classical music, if you will. Yes. So 
Eddie, yes. look up Hooked on Classics from the 80s by, uh, I can't remember the name of it, or but uh, they did, an early, in the early 80s, they did a Hooked on Classics that was wonderful. I still own in 45, and it's very catchy. It's played with an upbeat tune, and it's it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well at, the, well, at the present moment, Brian Wensloff seems to be the big music guru. So, Brian, mm -hmm. if you're li if you're, uh, which I know you're watching this, feel free to Google this or find out more about it. Let us know in the comments, or just feel free to give us your own opinion. Or maybe if you who are watching this have thoughts on what what music do you use for inspiration when you're creating something, when you're writing something, let us know in the comments. Mm -hmm. We would love to hear about it. So, Molly, any special memories from being at conventions for you or other events, whether you're there uh, as a vendor or there as an attendee? Um. What's an ND? No, an attendee. Oh, like you're attendee. attending the oh, event. Okay. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. I don't have my hearing aids in. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so as an attendee or a vendor is what I mean. Um, as an attendee, the first one I, I attended was the uh, um, Write Stuff Writers Conference in Indianapolis. And it, oh. and I didn't realize it until the second year, but it was basically a big push for Author House, <laughs> hmm. um, which I went with all their house for my second book and then everyone's like, no, 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 no. Don't ever pay anybody to work, to type, to uh, publish your book. And I'm like, but this is the only way that, that people are, this is the only people that are doing it. So, um, but in, in defense, yes, I spent entirely too much money on my first two books that I, well, I didn't spend a lot of money on my first book, but I spent a lot of money on my second book. It was still, it was, I think it was $700 but I didn't get any of the extras. All I did was they published the book and that's it and the cover and that's it. And then I did all the rest, but that got me, it was a stepping stone. It got me started on my journey to actual published author. And, but I learned a lot about how to create the elevator pitch, uh, oh, yeah. write a blurb, how to talk to people, you know, I learned how to promote myself from that conference. Mm -hmm. And then right now my favorite, um, I've got a, I've attended a bunch of conferences lately that I absolutely love. Um, uh, Imaginarium mm -hmm. is awesome for information. Mm -hmm. Vendor, my presence there is, I've been there consistently and my sales are starting to rise. So wow. hopefully it's, I mean, I've, there's been a lot of things that I have not made come anywhere close to making booth rent or travel expenses and imaginary is one of them, but I love the entire, the support you get from everybody and you meet people and everyone's buying everybody's books. And mm -hmm. it's just a very supportive tight knit community. Sure. Um, before COVID hit, um, I had met Brian Morris and he introduced me to a whole bunch. I never thought a romance author would be welcome at a comic convention. And do this is, I don't know if it was just luck of the draw or the fact that people were so starved after 2020 to get out. But I went to Superman festival for the first time. Ooh. And normally as a, if I'm there as a first time vendor, I'm good. If I sell four to six books, I sold 20 over three days at Superman Festival and was oh just blown God. away by the support. Goodness. And this is, correct me if I'm wrong, Superman Celebration in Metropolis, Illinois? Yeah, in Metropolis, Illinois. Yeah. Which, is, by the way, it's on my bucket list, Brian. Trust me. Me being the big Superman fan that I am, I need to get to Metropolis because it's where yeah. Superman lives. Yes. So it's kind of my thing. Yeah. But no, and that's And so, so that's Superman, great. I will be back to Superman. Um, awesome. I, let's see. That's I've good. been to... Must have been. Oh, um, Brian talked me into going to SalukiCon in 2019, and I did well. I, I think I sold six over a three-day period, so that wasn't too bad. And I'm going back in January. Oh. And I'm really praying, hoping and praying that the weather is good. Oh, yeah. Um, the but then mm -hmm. we scored a really good coup this past year. Mm -hmm. um, we had talked, our, our little writers group had talked about getting into either PopCon, Gen Con, or Comic Con in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And a, one of the gals, that, one of the writers had done the, the homework because we wanted to set up as a group. And they wouldn't, one of them, I think it was Gen Con, wouldn't allow us to share the booth. So uh, we got in and we found out that. Um, um, 
and my sales had been, I, I took a part-time job in 2019. So to mm -hmm. fund my trips because my husband mm -hmm. kind of cut me off financially. Mm -hmm. So um, last year we some we all signed up for Comic-Con and one of the writers was, was going to share the booth with one of the other, you know, two of the, two of the authors were going to share a table. Mm -hmm. And then I had my own and, but collectively we knocked it out of the park. People loved us. And Mixed Bag had just come, it was hot off mm -hmm. the press at, mm -hmm. at Indie Comic Con because they moved it to October due to the pandemic. So we had a good turnout. And like I said, um, I think I sold 18. Um, ben, our fantasy author, sold six because one of the people at the table next to them, they pulled up the on Sunday and didn't return. So he moved his stuff over there. And then had his own table and did very well. And I think that Nancy, she's our prolific one with the sci-fi, urban fantasy, and regular fantasy one. Um, I know by the end of Saturday, she alone had sold 18. And I think when I talked to her last week, I think during the entire three-day event, she sold over um, almost 30 bucks. So she did very well. Oh, wow. And, that and is my goodness. And she was like, well, do we want to go back to Comic-Con next year? And I'm like, yes, I want to go back because I had a great time. Not only because I got to, I set up a meet and greet with um, Lana Perillo of mm -hmm. Once Upon a Time and Ooh. Chandler, Chandler Ooh. Riggs of Walking Dead. I'm not a huge Walking Dead fan. But I like to watch the Talking Dead because then <laughs> I can catch up on the storyline without seeing all the... Right. I'm sorry. The, the When Negan joined the cast, I watched him bash um, Abraham and um, mm -hmm. eeny meeny miny mo. Yeah. And I, and when he was forcing Rick to make the decision you know, with, you know, cut off his son's arm or he'll be killed himself. I was like, Ouch. okay, I, that's enough for me. That, that I have reached my tolerance for that's, that's, that's kind that of, that was brutal. too much. Yeah. I, that was too much. <laughs> so uh, G Willikers. Well, it, I mean, congrats on all the success you've had up to this point. You said it yourself. You worked with a couple of writers. You sold a lot of books that yeah. weekend. So it was like putting together a dream team, if you will. Yeah. So that's, that is more than spectacular. And once again, Superman celebration, Brian K. Morris, I'm going to see you there, yes. brother. It's going to happen because I yes. love Superman. You love Superman. Tons of people love Superman. So yes. why not? Plus I'll bring my Smallville cosplay ju just for the crew. So <laughs> trust go. me. Yes. I have the red jacket. I have the blue t-shirt. I have a pair of jeans, a pair of boots. So I do look like a young, a, a bit of a younger Tom Welling. So I'm going to try yeah. to pull that off for you as best I can when I can get to Metropolis, Illinois as best I can. Now, before I move on to my next question, Brian Wenzoff has a wonderful question for you, okay. Molly. He asks, if you were transported to any fictional world from any comic or novel, where would oh, that be? Oh, jeez. Any fictional world. That's a deep question, Brian. Yeah, that is. Hmm. Oh, man. I'd have to think about that one. Well, we can all, you know, you can think about it for a few moments. We can always get back yeah. to it a little bit later. Brian, stay tuned. That's don't don't go don't go anywhere. And if you are watching this for the first time, thank you for being with us here on And I Quote. Make sure you're sharing this video with all 600 of your closest friends. They're going to like the way they look if they're watching this video. I guarantee it. Don't forget to tell your friends about us as well. So, what now? We're in the middle of National Novel Writing Month, mm -hmm. Nanorama Rimu, which is I know, which I know is a that's a mouthful. It's also <laughs> National Reading Month as well, because life is better when reading, if I do say so myself. Exactly. But what advice would you give for aspiring writers out there, Molly? Uh, learn. Uh, what I tell everybody is learn your craft, learn your genre, whatever you, um, you know, I grew up, my, my first attempt, my, my uh, Arbor University series came from the desire to create kind of a Laura Ingalls Wilder did with her slice of the 1800s. Well, I thought, okay, my Arbor U can provide a slice of the 80s, and this is what life, what we were dealing with in the 1980s. And, um, um, but I thought I was writing romance. I turned out I was actually writing women's fiction. So learn what genre you want to write, mm -hmm. uh, research, learn basic grammar. I know mm -hmm. it sucks. I hated grammar in, in, English class, but kudos. They at least taught me how to write a complete sentence and with, I still put, I, I admit I throw in too many commas, but at least I learned to craft your basic sentence structure and your paragraph right. and everything like that. Um, 
and then get with people, get online, find find your tribe, as Holly mm -hmm. uh, Philippi says, find mm -hmm. your tribe, find people that's, that uh, support you, will help you along the way, whether it being beta readers, um, getting you in touch with uh, publishers or at least people to help you teach you KDP. Now, KDP has opened up a huge um, opportunity for people, excuse me, because when I was starting out, there was no KDP, there was no create space. It was just you submitted to publishers mm -hmm. and I got nowhere. Well, then somebody I went, to, I found out about a local writers group went and a year later, got an email from the person and said, Hey, we're starting an online Yahoo thing. Come join us. Okay. I had DSL at the time. I didn't have dial up. So I joined next thing, you know, I'm talking to a person who knew a person who knew a person who was published and blogs were beginning to take off at then. So I started reading their blogs and interacting with people. And then they encouraged me to bump my heat level up a little bit and so I started doing that and sent it to them, said, what do you think of this? They're like, oh, that's great. Keep going. And Teacher's Pet was born. Kenzie Michaels was born at that time. And that's my Kenzie Michaels is my 18 and older person. I tell people that Molly Daniels is author peeking in the bedroom door. Kenzie's standing beside the bed taking notes. So if you don't like your bedroom scenes in your face, don't read Kenzie, read Molly. Mm -hmm. And, um, but just get with people who can help you um, better yourself creatively writing technique, you know, writing technique wise. Um, I've, the first time I signed up to edit someone else's work, it was a nightmare. The person had no concept of capital letters, no concept of a period and no concept of a comma. And it gave me a headache just trying to edit that first that first page. Mm -hmm. And I finally just sent her a, a polite email and said, I am sorry. I don't read this genre. I thought I did. You know, I can, I'm a person that can read anything. I'll read anything that grabs my attention. Because I'll read anything from my, my, I love medical horror. I write romance. I love medical dramas. And um, she wrote, she had this kind of out there sci-fi thing. But like I said, the woman had no concept of how to create a sentence. And it, it gave me a migraine. I don't get migraines, but I got a migraine reading that first draft. And so I just sent her a polite letter saying, I'm sorry, I cannot edit this. I'm obviously not the right person to do this and never spoke to her again but apparently she found someone that helped her because that first year she was putting out books left and right but she had a very abrasive online persona and would break into the chats at the time hey i just hit i just hit number five on amazon i'm like okay great this isn't your chat this is not your time to promote and after a couple of years, she just kind of dropped off the radar. I don't even see her online anymore. So I don't know what happened to her or what, but um, I decided back in the 2007, 2009 era when I was really starting to publish that I didn't want to be one of these authors that released a ton of books and then just kind of dropped off the, the, the face of the earth. I preferred the slow climb of a book or two a year and now there was this, there was a, a period of time from 2011 to 2013. I somehow got on the book of the month club where I was cranking them out and I had written them years before. So all I was doing was, you know, cleaning. I knew how to clean them up now. And because I, when I grew up, omniscient POV was a thing. You could head hop all over the place and no one, no one really batted an eye. Well, now you can't do that. So I learned how to, you know, be in one person's head per scene and do that. So I, um, I think I released um, seven books in one year and then the other six the next year. And that was exhausting because all I did for two years was sit at my computer and um, edit, release, submit, promote, edit, release, submit, promote. All I, that's all I did. 
and it was exhausting. And so in 14, I thought, okay, I'm going to go back to the one or two a year. If mm-hmm. I can do it every six months, it's much better pace for me. And then um, both my small press published the Kindle Unlimited hit, and it killed the small press. And both my two small publishers at the time folded because they couldn't keep up. And uh, readers were falling in love with the 99-cent books. And they no longer wanted to spend five dollars on a book. My limit was, I think my limit was twelve for an anthology. The most I ever paid for an anthology, an ebook at the time, was twelve bucks. And so I keep mine, my longer books, I keep around four ninety nine a month, four mm-hmm. ninety nine. Mm-hmm. And um, but like I said, Kindle Unlimited just killed the small press, and then I had to take a crash course in learning KDP. So. Mm. Just learn everything you can. I guess that's right. Yeah, how we got on that, the, that tangent was yeah, advice to writers just learn everything you can. Right, right, right on. So while you're still thinking of some of, uh, or excuse me, if you were going to be transported to a fictional mm-hmm. realm, whether it be from a comic or a novel, Brian has another question because apparently okay. Brian Wensloff drank too much <laughs> coffee this morning. He I've says, had one cup. So. He, sa- he says, Molly, what are some of your favorite films and or TV series? Um. Well, I just finished binge watching Hill Street Blues from the eighties. I found it on Heroes and Icons. So, oh, and it, it's um, I, I, again, it's very diverse. Um, movies would definitely be Star Wars, The Notebook. Mm. Um, love The Notebook. If what I, do you and, want? No, I got you. Huh? I got you. No, <laughs> one of the lines that Ryan Gosling always says is, "What do you want?" Because there's yeah. that thing that that's like a meme or something where he's looking at Rachel McAdams yeah. and she's like constantly not answering the question but he says what do you want yeah so like answer the question it's, it's yes an answer so you have the notebook you have star wars anything else um let's see good picks though um love the hair we love the harry potter books um Ooh. i love the harry potter movies up until well well yeah okay yeah i like the harry potter movies i wasn't a fan of the last two i don't know why but Mm-hmm. But um, book four is my favorite. Goblet of Fire. I love that whole, love that whole thing. Our, my uh, older son and I's favorite line to quote is still like a like a fresh breeze around my privates. Oh, gee, Willikers, that's something yes. else entirely. But yeah. still, okay, some good picks there. <laughs> good picks there. No worries. Um, and um, mm-hmm. let's see, loved Rock of Ages. Mm-hmm. I would love to go. I wish I'd gone with someone other than my husband because I was singing along and he's like, shh. Uh, Mama Mia, my mother and I went mm-hmm. and saw Mama Mia and we're both singing and <laughs> we're having a great time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm lately not much of a. I, I joke that the only time they take me to the movies anymore is when the new Star Wars comes out. Um, uh, well, my daughter and I went. No, my yep. daughter and I went and saw Fifty Shades of Grey, which was oh boy. interesting because I hated the books. I mean, I ripped them to shreds on my blog. That's the only book yeah. I will ever rip to shreds on my blog. That's and that's a whole other yeah. sort of, uh, circumstances. Let's just put it that yeah. way. Yeah. Now, I enjoyed one and three. Number two, I tried to sleep through. <laughs> and at the end of one, my daughter went, I paid $17 for this. And I'm like, yeah, well, I enjoyed the music. Okay. It was okay. But uh, it became kind of became our mother daughter thing was every year. We okay, mom, do we really want to go see book two? Yeah, let's go see two. And then the three came out like, do we really want to go see it? Well, we've seen one and two, let's go see three. And oh my gosh, we loved number three. And the funny thing about it, I tell people, is um, (laughs) we laughed through the whole thing, we weren't really paying attention to the storyline. The scene where they're in the bathtub in Aspen, my daughter and I are like, look at the scenery behind them. Oh, my God. The mountains are gorgeous. We're not paying attention to the people in the bathtub. We're yeah. looking at the background scenery. Yeah. And the scene where. Cinematography, um, as it were. Yes. And the scene where <laughs> she's sitting. Or the scene where she's sitting at the table. Yes. And Jimmy Doran walks in, opens yes. the refrigerator, turns around. Oh, I've been looking for you everywhere. And shuts the refrigerator. My daughter and I went in the refrigerator. He's looking at for her in the refrigerator. We just laughed through the whole thing. It's more of a comedy than anything else. It most is. likely, I haven't seen any of these movies. The only problem is I made the mistake of watching the marketing, aka the trailers, and I'm thinking yeah. these are just not even the marketing is good for this. I'm sorry, no. it's, it's, it's hot no. garbage. But it is. That's it is. just my two cents. If you think differently, I'll let you no. know. 
but the best part of the mo- the best part of all three movies is yes. the final minute of book three because or the final minute of the third mm-hmm. one because it right. shows you flashbacks from the others and my daughter was like we could have just all they yeah. did was show me that I'd just be happy because one of them is Tammy Dorn and shortlist doing push-ups and my daughter's like I could watch that all day I'm like, okay <laughs> mm. so, goodness gracious yeah the movies wow. are the the books are horrible but. The movie, the book, the the third movie is not that bad. Hmm. Well, I'm probably gonna get slammed for that, but we posed the question and you answered it, so we appreciate <laughs> you doing so. Thanks, Brian, for opening up a can of worms. But even now, TV so, shows, TV yeah, shows, yes, I loved, I loved, loved, loved. Once upon a time, mm-hmm. I liked it too. And um, yep, I was a fan. Er, I was a one sir. Once upon a time, okay, yeah, um, yeah, loved Er. I binge watched Er. Mm-hmm. Um, I need, I, I, I have to admit, um, I've not watched the Mandalorian yet. I need to find it. And Gotta see I, the Mandalorian. Gotta see yeah. the Mandalorian. This is the way, Molly. No, this is the way. I know. I know. I need to watch it. And, she um, um, I watched the first season of, of Stranger Things. I need to get back into it. Um, Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's on and, Netflix. New season. The trailer for the new season, I believe, just came out earlier this week. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, I am about two seasons behind on that. Oof, that's and, more um, to do. Yeah, and I sign up for Amazon Prime every year about this year, so I can watch the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Mrs. Maisel, yes, love that one. Okay, wow, some good picks, Molly. I am at goodness gracious, a lot of things for maybe you to catch up on, or maybe yeah. some stuff for for you know maybe I need to catch up on some of the stuff. I'm not well, sure, but Brian. Great question. Good on you, good sir, even though you yeah. opened up a can of worms. And just, Brian, we lost our local channels um, a couple of years ago because oh, we dear. have a tree that won't, um, that interferes with our dish signal. Ooh. And rather than cut it down, we just opted to not get our local channels. But um, um, for a while there, I was watching Bull, oh, yeah. uh, Manifest, mm-hmm. uh, all the CBS comedies on Thursday night. Um Law, Law and Order uh, SVU yes. is my favorite of the champ of the which franchise. is still going. It's yes, still going. and it kills me that I can't watch. The, I have to wait. Um, actually, I might be able to pick it pick it up on. Um, I think it's USA that that, that reruns it on Thursday nights um, mm-hmm. at like ten o'clock at night. I need to check because that's how I watched. I think I, I think that's how I watched uh, um, season twenty one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Last few I seasons, need to yeah. I need to get back on I need to get back into that one. And my well, husband's like, "Didn't you just watch this?" No, I haven't seen this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are their stories, Molly. Yes. Let's see what I did there. Yeah. So my goodness, a heck of a question. Brian yeah. chimes in. He says, "My wife is actually a language arts teacher. It's her seventeenth year of teaching. Yes, reading, writing, as well as learning your grammar is super important." <laughs> Yes. So he, so he agrees with you on that front. Brian also says that growing organically is the right way to go and learning your craft and things of that mm-hmm. nature. Oh, look who's here. Michaela Jade says hello there. Hi, Michaela. Hello, Michaela. My goodness gracious. Another legendary writer. Yes. I got goodness. to meet her at Heroes for Kids last year. It was great. We had a great time. Did you? That is yes. just splendid. Yeah. Brian says, I love the Nicholas Sparks books as well as the movies. Brian, yes. you are. That takes a lot of guts to admit that. Yes. A lot of guts. And I'm also. Um, I also love Jody Picoult's books. Um, a lot of my romance readers hate Jody Picoult because she never has a, because of her endings. I'm not going to give them away, but mm. I love them. I am a voracious Jody Picoult person. I got hooked with um, uh, my sister's keeper, and I just went back and bought all of them. Oh, you mean that one? Okay, fair, yeah. fair enough. Fair enough. Brian, I didn't says- like what the movie did. The movie did not stay true to the book. I I was watching the movie after I read the book. I'm like, that's not how it's supposed to end. <laughs> So, hmm. but her books are wonderful. Hollywood, they call it creative liberties. And then, yes. <laughs> and, then, and yeah, yeah, and I have to admit, in book three of my chosen series, My Sci Fi Romance by Kenzie Michaels, mm-hmm. I was binge watching Deep Space Nine right before I wrote it. So I ripped off, and I, I, I had the unique pleasure of meeting Armin Shimmerman, who played Quark in oh. Deep Space Nine. I met him at Comic Con. And I told him, I said, I, here I am, a huge Star Wars fan. And my in my my uh, sci-fi series, I ripped off the Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Uh, my space station is described as a 
as a uh, skyscraper surrounded by a wagon wheel. And he goes, well, why wouldn't you rip it off? It was a wonderful show. And I said, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were a part of it. So, hey, all, all, all good there. I actually just became a Star Trek uh, fan uh, during the course of the, <laughs> the Corona Miley Cyrus. Yeah. So, and my favorite Star Trek film, I haven't seen the series yet. I'm in the pro I'm mm. starting, hopefully, but surely going to start getting into the process of catching up on the series respectively. But my favorite Star Trek film is First Contact. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Because I'm a, I'm a big Patrick Stewart fan. One. I'm a big Patrick Stewart fan. So, okay. Cap yeah. I mean, Captain Picard, make it so. I mean, come on. Yes. Um, yeah. When um, my, my uh, older son was born, we were watching Next Generation every night at 1030 on Fox. And go. when he was three months old, I went to, took him to the doctor for a checkup. And I said, there's been a mistake. We've, he's been switched to birth. This child who used to go down about nine o'clock at night and would sleep till seven, seven, eight o'clock in the morning is now going to bed at seven and waking up at ungodly hours. He goes, Molly, you're just going to have to give up your Star Trek every night and go to bed early. And I'm like, that's, no. hard, that's hard to do. <laughs> I mean, that, that'd be hard for me. And now that I'm a TNG fan, that'd be hard for me to do. So yeah. If, if I were watching it back then when it first aired, I'm sorry. Yeah. But G Willikers, Brian, Brian once again says, when, according to Nicholas Sparks, I love the way he, or no, not that one, excuse me. He says he knows how to write women, according yes, to Brian, about his opinion about Nicholas Sparks. Yes. Hmm. And one of my criticisms has been that my men in the early, in my early books, they all sound, the men always sounded alike. So I found a gentleman who was a longtime friend, and I would send him snippets and say, Tell me if I'm getting the men right. And sometimes he's like, no, 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 no. Men don't think that way. And so I would change it. So I was very fortunate to have a, a wonderful guy friend who would reel me back in. And this is how guys think. So hopefully my men are getting a little better. <laughs> exactly. And then this is also the friend <clears throat> after his, he had a, he went through a divorce. Sure. His girlfriend yeah. came up one day arrived at his house and said, I'm horny and pressed for time. Take your pants off. Wow. And he told me, he said, you have got to work this into one of your stories. This is, this is too good not to use. And so I put it, I was able to put it in Idris bet and I read, sent it to him. I said, how's this? And he goes, Oh, that's great. This is fantastic. Boy, that's one way so. to derail a conversation. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's fine. No, take, listen, whatever works, works for a writer or a story or a set of circumstances. Let's just put it that way. Brian yeah. Wensloff, I don't know where you come up with this stuff. He says 50 Shades films are actually, they're pretty good. It does have a deeper meaning if you look past the sexual yeah. overtones. And I'm thinking, Brian, did, what, what, did some, what did you do? Honestly, <laughs> did you have way too much coffee again? What are you doing back Maybe there? Maybe he hasn't had enough. <laughs> I don't think you've had enough coffee down there in the state of Florida there, Brian. So wake us up when you've actually had your fair share of caffeine. Yeah. But still, I digress. Goodness gracious. Wow. Uh, Any who? Okay, Brian, I guess if I would have to, if I could go back in any fictional um, thing, yes. it would either be um, Deep Space Nine or Next Generation, just one episode. There Maybe it, I would, well, it's interesting because one of my stories is based on a Star Trek premise mm -hmm. when Q gives Picard the opportunity to go back in time and correct something that he's always regretted Ooh. and then show where he's been. Sure, sure. That's yeah. something I would love to do because there I do have a sincere, not really a regret, but I want always wonder what would have happened if I had not if mm -hmm. I was faced with a choice and I chose one path, what would have happened if I had chosen the other path? I've always wondered about that. Hmm. And so that premise is kind of I put that in my time travel trilogy that I'm writing. I've written the first one and I've written the third one. I just have to focus and get the second one out there so I can publish it because um, it's, they're too short or they're too long to be a part of our local anthologies because I think one's a, almost 12,000 words and I forget what the other one was, but um, I need to, we decided just to put them all in a trilogy and publish them that way. Oh. And um, but that's actually one of the, I would love to do a scene with Q and maybe mm -hmm. go back and, you know, fictionally do something like that. 
hmm. or Deep Space Nine, you know, go hang out with Quark. <laughs> uh, there's, yeah, there's, uh, there's always that red alert, as Q once said in an episode of TNG that I will not name, but still, I, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, once again, talking with Molly Daniels, writer and poet. If you have any questions for her, let us know in the chat. Let us know in the comments. Make sure you're sharing this video with all 500 of your closest friends. They're going to like the way they look after watching <laughs> this video. I guarantee it. So, Molly, who are some of your favorite writers of today that don't start and end with Brian K. Morris of Rising Tide Publications? There's your there's your free plug there for you, Brian. Take a shot. There you go, Brian. BKM, you got to take a shot. So, um, but yeah, that's the question on the table. Who are some of your favorite writers of today? Who you got? Writers today. Um, Could be anybody. Well, Oh, I love absolutely love Amy Hale's new book, um, Neurosis. Yes. I could not put that thing down. I stayed up till 2 a.m. finishing it. Loved it. And love it, love it, love it, love it, mm -hmm. love it. I read that as well. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. I like Kathy Jackson. Mm -hmm. I like some of her work. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. See who am I reading right now? Oh, I've I've fallen in love with um oh what's his name? Is it Kevin Kwan who wrote the Crazy Rich Asian Crazy Rich Asians? I'm not a hundred percent sure. If anyone knows, let us know but in the comments. His his books are wonderful. I love those. If you just want to light read, I mean it it will just absolutely take you out of your day. And um, when I found out he, there was more books of those, I went out and bought them. And then I watched them. I found the movie later and watched it. Um, let's see. <coughs> like I said, still reading Jodie Picoult. Um, let's see. Don't laugh. I just picked up um, Battle of the Brothers, the the one between William and Harry. Oh, because I'm I'm kind of a royal watcher. I've you know fell in okay. love with the old Princess Diana and watched the boys grow up. So, oh yeah, mm. yeah. Um, who else? If I gotten on my thing, I mean, on my blog, every at the beginning of every month, I list what I'm reading and then I put in there, you know, did not finish or, you know, loved it. Deck, uh, if I if you see a D A in bold, it's definitely recommended read, mm -hmm. which means I loved it, loved it, loved it. Can't read <laughs> to read it again. If it just has a recommended read, reads, I loved it, but I probably am not going to read it again for probably 10 years or so or whenever I pull it out of a box. Um, and then there's some that are just, that they're, they're good. You know, if I've got a whole stack that I've, I'm finally getting into the books that I, that I bought last, um, let's see, I just finished the ones that I, that I bought between Imaginarium and, um, Superman because I bought Amy's at Superman. So yeah, I'm getting into the, the ones that have been since then. And some of them have and actually the ones that I'm reading right now came out of my mother's storage unit when we we decided to go in and kind of purge some things. I found a whole tote mm -hmm. of books and so I'm reading some of those. Huh. And um yes, Brian, pull for reality is coming up. It's listed. <laughs> Can't wait to read that one. And um, there you go. So yeah, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm very diverse in what I love. I, sure. Like I said, I, I started off with children's books and Little mm -hmm. House on the Prairie, and morphed into Laverne Spencer and Danielle Steele, and then I found Michael Palmer's Medical Mysteries. I love Stephen King, some of Stephen King. Um, I'm very much across the board. Whatever grabs my attention, I'll I'll probably pick it up and read it. Oh, sure, sure. That's the beauty of reading. Never know what you're going to discover. Never know what mm -hmm. universes you're going to tap into or what new yeah. or, you know, classic writers you may discover along the way. And yeah. Brian chimes in. He says, I'm actually only on my first cup of coffee, Ryan. Well, I've only had one, too. Thanks for letting us know, Brian, because I thought you wait. Don't you wake up every morning at like 7 or 8 a.m.? I'm not sure. You know, Brian, I never really understood your weird little habits. So if you have an explanation it's for the that. the best part of waking up. No, yeah, it's that's the best part of waking up. Well, that's true too, Molly. I'm not going to argue that point. But with that being said, I have a set of fun little questions for, uh, here for you, Molly. And these questions are powered by this episode of And I Quote, and should I say every episode of And I Quote, is indeed powered by Poddex. Poddex are the hottest new tool for podcasters looking to have more meaningful conversations or gamify their podcasts. You shuffle these things up. You ask a question. You let the content roll. You get yours today at poddex.com. Make sure you use the promo code NERDCULTURE to get 10% off your order, you're not going to want to miss it. So, Molly, first things first, 
Okay. What is one thing that people buy that you think is a total waste of money? What is one thing that people buy that I find is a total waste of money? Yes. Is a total oh, waste geez. of money. Could be anything. <laughs> any object, um, any specific item, could be anything. Those stupid wreaths that they put on the doors. I mean, I go to craft fairs and everybody's flocking to those stupid wreaths. Now, I kind of get it because now my mother's in assisted living and we actually bought her one of those stupid wreaths. We bought her, you know, some um, festive ones to hang on our door. But I don't... F to decorate my house, I know. I have, I have a Christmas wreath that was bought 30 years ago and that's, mm -hmm. I'm happy with it. I think there, that's it. <laughs> there you go. No need to buy another one uh, for, no. for you or your family, respectively. So, if you, I'm sorry if I offended anybody out there, but I don't like those. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We ask the question and you answer. Yeah. We appreciate your answers, by the way, Molly. If you were in charge, what three items would you have in the office vending machine every day? Peanut butter Twix. Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. definitely peanut butter Twix. That's my favorite candy bar. Well, there you go. Um, if I could put anything in that vending machine. Mm -hmm. Yep. What three things would you have in the office vending machine every day? <laughs> three items. Um, pens. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm, I'm a, I love pens. There you go. And I'm always, it heart breaks my heart when they, when they, uh, run, run out of, out of ink. Yeah. Um, and Always books, great books. Well, well, no, we have a little library in our brick room, so not book. I will yeah, not books. No. Um, oh, geez. <laughs> um, maybe gold leaf iced tea. I'm not a fan of the pure leaf. We have pure leaf in our, in ours. So. Oh, okay. I like the gold leaf a little better. Oh, okay. Right. Good iced tea. So you got a little bit of a food, a beverage, and a writing utensil, something yeah. known as pens, because you can never have enough pens in the house. Or no, in this case, don't. it would be in your office located within the vending machine itself. So we'll leave it at that. I have a cup of, I've got a, one of my friends had, um, gave away a coffee mug several years ago and I used it to hold my pens. So the ones that I'm currently using and my granddaughter has fallen in love with them. And I went in there the other day and there was only two in the cup. I'm like, where did all my pens go? And then come to find out she dismantled one of them. One of the, I had a, some, I think, um, some, a pen that I had picked up at, at some event mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and multicolors in it. And she took the thing apart. <laughs> so I'm like, well, maybe I'll run into her again and I can get another one. I'll buy multiples, you know, put them in the cup and then hide the, hide the rest. <laughs> Well, there you go. Uh, support indie creators and support exactly. uh, small businesses. There you go. Yes, and keep them away from inquisitive nine-year-olds who like mm -hmm. to dismantle things. How does this thing work? You can always buy you a book called How yes. Things Work, and then you won't have to dismantle the actual objects. Oh, no, it's much more fun to take it apart, you know. Okay. Well, that's fair, too. I'm not, I don't want to, you know, throw <laughs> anyone's creativity out the window yeah. completely, but I'm just saying if you want to save some time and energy, you can always get the book. Nothing's wrong <laughs> with reading a book or an encyclopedia. <laughs> Oh, no. I mean, did anyone remember we the encyclopedias know. we had at our school libraries when we were yes. children? I mean, I remember those things just being on those aisles on those smaller shelves, you know, right here. Yes. I'm older it's, than Google. Yes. Encyclopedias no, and the Dewey Decimal System was our Google. Well, that, that that's okay. Hey, listen, Molly, age is just a number. Don't worry about it. By the way, sure. Brian has an answer to the question. What three items would you want to put in an office vending <laughs> machine? He says, let me see, rum, rum Coke. Coke, and oh, chocolate yes. chip cookies. Wow, yeah. Brian. You're really kicking ha kicking off happy hour early, aren't you? At nine at nine a.m. Yes, I totally agree. Gee Willikers, Brian. Yes, those are the Maybe three Bailey's, things. Bailey's Irish cream. Hmm. Well, there's, there's that. So if you're going to have something in your office vending machine, what would it be? Let us know in the chat. We would love to. It was a silver tequila. If, maybe I'm not. I'm not quite sure. What do I know, right? I, I'm I'm just a podcast host and a producer, I might add. But anywho, uh, next question: Have you ever been kicked out of anything? And if so, what was it? Could be anything. Have I ever been kicked out of anything? And if so, what, um, what was it? Uh, I don't think I've been kicked out of anything. Hmm. I honestly don't think I. 
Big <laughs> <laughs> Brian chimes in. It's five o'clock somewhere, Ryan. Thanks, exactly. Brian. We appreciate exactly. that. Thanks for chiming in there, exactly. buddy. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Well, how about this one? What is your kryptonite, Molly? My kryptonite, chocolate. See there. See there's. There you go. <laughs> there, that's yeah, the it's... thing. That's the thing. Hershey, Bl be... Hershey Bliss chocolates, Lindor chocolates. Oh, love them. Oh. Well, love the... them. There you go. That answers that that super that answers that awesome tacular question. We want to we want to take this opportunity to thank Molly Daniels for being our guest this week on And I Quote. Molly, thank you so much for being with us. What projects do you have coming up and where can everyone find you online? Uh, they can find me on I'm on Amazon.com. Uh, MollyDaniels.wordpress.com is my website. Eventually I'll get that WordPress.com out of there and just be it can't be mollydaniels.com. I had a t-shirt made up with that, and a friend of mine pointed out that uh, the person who owns that posts naked pictures of themselves. Like, that's not me. That is not me. Mm -hmm. um, um, my website has all the links to my blog, and it should have all the links to my books. Um, I'm not, I need to pull my books out of Kindle Unlimited or mm -hmm. Kindle Select, whatever it is, and go wide. I think one of my I think Teacher's Pet is is available on BarnesandNoble.com or BNN.com, um, and of course you can walk into any major bookstore and request me, and they will order it for you. If, oh. um, well, that is that is. And then uh, first, I think, I think first I haven't checked, but I think it's FirstCityBooks.com. That's our local imprint that has all right. um, catered romances through it. Um, we just. We just formed a local imprint to if we are, can ever go in as a publisher one day and set up as, you know, so we can all be at the same table. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, I said, we don't publish your book for you. We're not a publisher. We're not a true publisher. But we have access to um, editors, cover artists. Uh, for one of our members is a wonderful formatter. She's a math teacher at the local high school and she's got that wonderful combination of left right brain thing that goes on and she can she can do it all. She's great. And which is a very valuable asset to have in your local writers group. So we can have we have resources we can hook you up with to help you get your book published. But we found out through trial and error that if we accept your manuscript, we expect you to understand how a, how a, you know, we expect you to have it in Word doc, Word doc format. So, and not WordPad, not writing on your phone and not having a clue as to, um, we need you to, to understand basic grammar and capitalization because we had somebody turn in poetry and Nancy had no clue if she actually meant small lowercase i and u instead of y-o-u <laughs> and so she was not very happy when she, the first draft of hers arrived because she formatted as she was given it and there you go so understand mm. that if you want y-o-u don't send us something with just a u <laughs> <laughs> Well, once again, thank you very much for being with us here, Molly Daniels. The links to where you can find Molly are located within the description of this video, as well as the links for other guests we have had previously here on And I Quote. Those are located in the descriptions of those respective videos, which you can find on our YouTube channel. Make sure you're following us on all forms of social media, simply at It's Neuroculture. New videos are being posted each and every week. And I Quote is every Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern time, so make sure you tune in for that. Once again, my name is Ryan of Neuroculture. To you, from, on behalf of myself, on behalf of Molly, we wish you to uh, wish you well, stay healthy, stay strong, stay safe, support content creators of all shapes and sizes, support small businesses, read books, and in the words of a wise person that once said, live long and prosper and happy, or excuse me, happy National <laughs> Writing, National Novel Writing Month, happy National Reading Month, all that good stuff. Yes. Take care. I'm GW Pomager. I'm Dina Marie. I'm Sage Ia. I'm Thomas Carter Rochester. Hey, I'm David Thompson. Hi, I'm Kevin. And I'm Mia. Hi, I'm Mark. Hey there, this is Dave Adams. Hi, I'm Rosemary Rose. 
Jerome Connor here. Hey guys, it's Josh Bauer. It's Willow Skyler. I'm Cosplay Michael. I'm Bob. It's your boy Country. Hey, I'm Ryan Permison. And I'd like to ask you guys to please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please, please, please subscribe. 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 Please subscribe to HWWS Web TV. Great bunch of people. And don't forget to smash the bell. Ring that bell. Smash that bell. Hit that bell. Hit the bell to be notified. Hit the bell to get notified of new shows and videos. You're going to want to do that, so do that soon. So we can cross that 20,000 mark. And get us to 100,000 subscribers. To a million and 10 million and 100 million. On HWWS. Web TV. You really like it. I guess.